she said, so I need to know how willing you would be to help me hurry and sit you down and teach you two flies, and then you would teach half of the class, and I would teach half of the class. Oh, I was scared to death. So I thought, I, I, at very best, my, my fly time was very, you know, very, uh, just not good. That's all I could say. It was okay, but just not what I, the perfection part of my personality. That was Rainy Writing telling us the story of how she bluffed her way through a fly tying class early in her career. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, episode 114. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. I've updated uh, our resources page on the blog that shows the top resources highlighted by guests of this show. Go to wetflyswing.com slash resources, or just click, click the uh, link in the top of uh, the header and uh, find out what resources are new and recommended. In today's episode, I talk with Rainy Writing, the person who founded Rainy's Flies. She uh, talks about her most popular p- uh, patterns, how she develops new products, and the ethics of fly tying. Don't miss this one as Rainy clarifies whether she is uh, retiring from the company this year. So, without further ado, here's Rainy Writing. How's it going, Rainy? Very good. And how about you, Dave? Good, good. It's really good to have you on here. I'm I'm circling around to a bunch of the the names that, that come out in the fly tying world. I've I've had a number of different seasons now on this podcast, and now I'm going into a fly tying season. And that's why I reached out to you because your name and the rainy, um, you know, rainy's flies comes up a lot out there. So I'm hoping to dig into the background there and and talk about everything. But could you maybe just talk about how you first got into uh, fly fishing and fly tying. I know the little bit of story there on fly tying. It's a pretty interesting one. Okay. Well, I'll be happy to do that and stop and correct me if you want to uh, add something or ask another question. My my love for fly fishing started with my grandfather. And we used to, he used to take me up into the mountains. And at age five, I caught my very first fish with a fly on the end of a spin cast rod. And from that moment on, I would absolutely have been hooked. What, where did you grow up or when, when you, you know, where did you grow up originally? I am from a little town in Utah called Roosevelt. And we are at the bottom of the big chain lakes that are up there that people go backpacking in to fish. Oh, cool. Cool. And, uh, and is Rose, now, now Rose, I'm not totally familiar with that area. Could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, maybe that, that area and then maybe tell us a little bit about your, your folks. I did not do any fly tying or fly fishing or any type of fishing with my father. Uh, he was into his kind of, he worked very hard, but we worked, we had a cattle ranch. And so he worked very hard at that. And then we also, and I was raised in a Phillips 66 gas station. So I've learned how to change tires and, <laughs> and do all of that kind of stuff. So I kind of had a diverse background. That's for sure. That's cool. What did you know? Le- my father, my yeah. father had nothing. Oh, he, he did. What, what did you learn from the cat, the cattle ranch? Do you remember anything from that time? I remember that it was hard work. Was it? <laughs> it was a lot of work, yes. I was, uh, uh, there were five brothers and sisters I had, and I figured that my dad figured I was his third son because where my sisters got to work in the house and learn how to cook, I was thrown out on a horse and headed to the alfalfa fields to do my daily chores. So, uh, <laughs> So nice. that's, it's kind of, like I said, my, my very diverse background. Gotcha. And, and you're, I'm not totally familiar with the, the whole background, but you, you pretty much live in uh, the Southeast Asia part of the year. Is that, is that the case now? Well, I'm mostly retired now, but yes, in the past it was uh, down in Asia. Yes. The oh. Southeast Asia. Yes. Well, I started fly fishing again while we were up in the, uh, after hauling hay and doing all of the, the, farm work that we had to do and I would go fishing with my brothers on the uh, lower part of the Uintas and they would we would they reluctantly took me but (laughs) it was from then I took the information that which I had learned from my grandfather and was able to put it to use and and so I fished 
uh, with some of that knowledge that what grandpa was showing me. But I always, when I, until I graduated from high school, I only fished fly fishing, but it was on a spin cast reel. Gotcha. After graduation from high school, um, my husband and I married and headed off to university for studies. And after completion of his, um, his studies, we moved forward to try to get me graduated. Many things personally came up in, in our physical relationship. No, that's the wrong word. In our relationship, ended up in a divorce. And I had, by that time, I was about 21, 22 years old. And I, I sought after a, 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 um, how I was, I was thinking about how am I going to make a living with, with right. these four kids that I had. And I knew that I had this flight time background. And so what happened was, was my mother loaned me a little bit of money and we put in an ad in Field and Stream and then in a magazine that was called at the time Fly Fishing the West. The Fly Fishing the West magazine has long been out of publication, mm -hmm. but it was used. And so I took a little one inch square ad in Field and Stream in the back. And then I took a half page ad in Fly Fishing the West because it was about the same price as the one inch in, um, um, mm -hmm. in the Field and Stream magazine. And so I sent out some inquiries. And then in addition to that, people responded, shops, fly shops responded to that. I had a company back on the East Coast, one in Texas, three on the California coast that took uh, a look at the ads and sent me off some, would you be willing to tie this? Uh, yeah. At the time, I didn't know very much, but but when um, it was actually Raymond Rumpf on the East Coast who got me started in this because they sent an order to me to tie 350 dozen of uh, of um, hmm. grand hoppers. Let's see. Oh, it's yeah. a, a wet rock. It's a similar, the, the head on the deer head that was at the time part of the Whitlock hook series that I didn't realize what the story was, but uh -huh. the bottom line was, is they sent me this order and I said, Whoa, wow, I don't have a clue what the name of this play is. I don't even know what it looks like. And so I, that put me into starting to research and search out and uh, they, we eventually got the flies to them, but it was a little bit of a trial and error, but that's how I basically got started. Part of a job that I worked at with Utah State University was Utah State University was flying campus professors out to rural parts of Utah. Price, Utah and Roosevelt, Utah were the two that had been picked. And I had applied for a job and I and I was uh, given uh, employment through the Utah State Extension and Utah State University. My job was to pick up campus professors, drop, drop them off at their classes and then go back home and get on the on the the flight and get them back to logan utah safe and sound you, you were saying flight so but w what do you mean pick pick up the people were you picking them up uh, in a car or how are you picking up I, the... I would pick them up in a car but i would pick them up at the logan airport excuse me the roosevelt airport or it could have been the vernal utah airport and so but that was my job was to, to go and pick up professors and then take them back home. Or, excuse me, take them back to the airport oh, so I they see. would catch a flight and go up to Logan. So gotcha. it was kind of a back and forth I gotcha. thing like that. Okay, so th so and this so, was but, the, yeah, th this was the university. This was when you were uh, still not not quite graduated. This is when you were still in the university doing this. That's right, right. And I, like I said, I took some classes while I was waiting for the campus professors to finish up their classes i also just took a couple of classes and i got to do it for free which was nice and but i was able to work on my general education classes and but okay. one of the one of the professors that we were flying back and forth was a gentleman who mentored me and his name was art jones and we would work together through the extension office because that was his role but he also taught some classes and so we had signed up, it, it was decided that the, through the campus of Utah State University and out in these rural areas that this Art Jones wanted to teach some flight time classes. And so uh, all of a sudden we had on our enrollment, we had 36 guys, not women, only guys who had signed up 
to do a fly tying class and they could get a couple of credits for it. Mm. Did your husband, I'm trying to think, I'm pr- putting the connection back to your, your ex-husband. Was he a part of the Rainey's Flies uh, business? No, but he's part of it in a, in a big way, which I'm going to hurry and get to. Okay. Uh, so in between all of this, I eventually got married and started having a family and was trying to learn how to tie flies because I was trying to get fly orders in to their shops that were ordering from me so I could pay tuition for my husband. Oh, and I see. that's how that got started. So, so gotcha. then one, I had, I had collected, I had a locker, a foot locker. I don't know if I can picture that with you. You might be young enough. You don't oh, yeah. know, but a foot, a foot locker is like three feet, maybe yep. by 18 inches high. Okay. Sure. Well, over the, over a short period of about two and a half years, I had that foot locker filled with fly tying materials. And, uh, my husband got pretty upset with me one day and he said, I'll tell you what, I need you to count up all of this money and we have spent in buying fly tying materials. And at the time, there were a few fly shops that actually were selling some fly tying materials. Raymond Rump, going back to that, was one that I was able to get some mm. uh, good fly tying materials from. Anyway, so we, we, uh, belligerently i was really upset that you know i was trying to make money but anyway doug is my husband he said you need i need to know exactly what you spent and so that morning i sat down while he was at class and i started counting out financially all the money that i'd spent which had come to about three thousand two hundred dollars Oh, my husband was livid <laughs> and i was kind of disappointed too but but he said i'll tell you what if you're going to continue this, you're going to learn how to, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to learn how to make money in this. So you've got about a month. And then if not, we're, we've got some serious issues here, <laughs> sweetheart, I guess. Right. Uh, but that's how I, and so shortly thereafter, uh, we separated and then I used that to, uh, which was a good challenge that you've given me, but at least it gave me some incentive to try to get some work yeah. and, and get some money made. And so that's kind of how he played a role in it. Gotcha. But I, I had an incredible passion for it. I just, anytime something would be given to me and asked to figure out, I had that part of my personality that just went, I can do this. I can do this. I'm going to figure this out. Yeah. So did we you, figured it out. And then I started making some money. How did you, so you had um, uh, Art Jones. It sounds like he was one of your mentors and taught you. I mean, how did you learn the craft of, of tying flies? Was it something you you picked up from a, a bunch of different people? Thank, thank you for let's let's clarify that. Yes, um, working for the Utah State University, Art Jones and I had good access to one another, and again, it was it had been decided, and, and Art Jones pretty much uh, was the 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 go behind behind it, but. He decided that we would have fly tying classes taught to the rural people of Utah. And I got a telephone call one evening. I had just returned from work uh, about the five o'clock, six o'clock era or time frame. And he calls me on the phone and he says, Rainey, I need you to the office immediately. Well, he scared me to death. I mean, I thought, what have I done? What did I didn't do or what should I have done? And so, he said, get to the office. We'll talk about it. So I got to the office and that's when he said to me, Rainey, we've had 36 guys sign up for this class. You were to have divided the class and had one in one time frame and another one in another time frame. So we could, he could teach the class, but he, so we ended up, we ended up and he, he asked me, he said, uh, what are we going to do about this? And I said, Art, I have absolutely no idea. And he says, well, I can't possibly teach this many guys. She said, so I need to know how willing you would be to have me hurry and sit you down and teach you two flies, and then you would teach half of the class, and I would teach half of the class. <laughs> oh, I was scared to death. So yeah. I thought, I, I, at very best, my, my fly time was very, you know, very... Uh, just not good. That's all I could say. Yeah. It was okay, but just sure. not what I, the perfection part of my personality uh, was. So 
I looked at him and I said, we can't, I can't, there's no way. And I said, I'll have to accept your challenge. And so we had 30 minutes before the class started to arrive. Anyway, so he taught me two flies. It's one of the string ants and one was a woolly bugger. Actually, excuse me, not woolly bugger, woolly worm. Woolly worm. And so I taught, went and practiced as fast as I could and tried to see just how much I could do. But we ended up, the guys started coming in, and there were about 6, 30, 36, 32 guys. We divided it in half. He gave me 15, and wow. I have never bluffed my way through anything. <laughs> I was bluffing. I was doing the best I could to bluff. <laughs> how'd you, how'd you, we, hey, we you had if you take it, could you take us to that moment of how you bluff your way through a, a teaching? It sounds like sixteen people or something like that. How, how's that? How's that look? Well, it was I, like I said, it was terrifying. Yeah. I thought I can't do this. I can't do this. But like you said, he was very good, a bit very patient with me while well, he taught me these two flies, and I literally started demonstrating. They kind of could stand behind you. Some would sit around you in the front. But to get a real feel for fly tying, I had people over the, my shoulders, just, yeah. you know, trying to snatch everything that I was trying to do. And you know what? I actually, well, I must have been successful because Art Jones, the following mail well, midweek, he said, you know what? You did pretty good. How would you like to, we could teach you a couple more flies. And I said, oh, all right, I'll do it. If you <laughs> want me to do it, I'll do it. So he taught me two more flies. And then the next week, it was two more. So now we're at six. And that's after uh, 12 weeks, I had learned approximately 24 patterns that I had demonstrated. He had wow. taught me prior. I had some time to, time to, uh, um, how to, how to just have some time to do it. So it was, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And I still have some, some of these old guys that were, well, they were half my age, but we see each other once in a while and oh, we yeah. have a good chuckle about how I, bluff my way through were, them incredibly <laughs> were there other crazy. were there other women uh you know flying uh, tying flies or teaching or anything back then that you remember um uh, it was we were i was pretty much an anomaly because the answer to your question was, was no i i wasn't aware of any and of course i was raised in in the Uinta Basin versus on the West Coast and certainly not on the East Coast because they were probably, obviously, we didn't do a lot of business with them. And I tied mostly for shops there uh, in the California and Texas area oh, yeah. where I ended sure. up my... Is, it, is that where the... Well, the Rainies Fly, so, so basically it started out as a... I mean, pretty much, did you just start the company there? I mean, where did it go from that? So you're doing... You're in college teaching that and then how'd you go into having this this flight tying actual you know actual company well it was actually the like selling to the shops that i what were tying for in california and the texas area and i just in order to be able to do it legally i had to acquire a business license and at the time i was living in a bedroom community of logan utah and i had I have a business license, and then they asked me, well, what's the name of this company? And I went, I don't have a clue. I'll have to get back to you. So <laughs> I went back and just started tossing some things around and said, well, let's just go. The first company that I founded was the Rainey's Trout Flies. And the Rainey's Trout Flies is very limiting compared to where we were back that time of that 1971, yep. 74 time. So yeah, so basically I was just kind of, so so you had this company in the mid 70s that you started and tying flies, and then you slowly build it up. I mean, at what point do you, did you look back and realize you've got yourself uh, a, a company where you needed more than just yourself to, to run it? What was that like? Yeah, that was great. I actually, uh, through the um, Green River, uh, there was a, a company up there that, we had become good friends with a guy named, uh, see, I can't forget his name. Good friend, but I can't remember his name. Anyway, he had called me on the phone and I was trying to tie some flies for him, which was a cicada. And he said, we've got to have, it's going to have high flotation, rainy. And so he challenged me. And at the time, the only thing I could find would, would be the macrame rope that was available at that time and we needed diet black or whatever, but we came up with a cicada using this 
macrame foam and it's been heavily glued so it would kind of keep the air chambers up high and that's how it kind of got started from there was from the flaming uh, the flaming george lodge that's up there and his asking me to try to come up with something imitating a cicada which is a huge hatch off of the green river oh, okay uh up the yeah. upper green river so um that's kind of how that got started yeah and then um from there uh I just could I was at the time tying about 500, 600 dozen flies a year just by myself. Oh, really? It was just getting to be a, at a point that was just wait. I just couldn't keep up with it. And so at the, one of the bosses of the the campus bosses of the uh, of the um, um, extension program, he had a son that he said was super amber amber direction. I can't oh, even say uh, it. Ambidextrous. Amber, Thank you, yeah. if you want to put that ambidextrous. Yeah. So uh, he said, I said, well, how old is he? And he said, oh, he's 10 years old. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I've been tying flies. And I started teaching, as a matter of fact. I should have left that out, too. But, but anyway, I said, oh, no, no, he's just too young. And he said, oh, Brady, I promise you, he is, would be so good. And so I reluctantly had him drop his son off to my home. And we went and started tying flies, and I'll tell you what, that young man could tie like no other. <laughs> later, 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 little, uh, no, or a little more information to him was that he is now a very, uh, incredible surgeon that's living up in the Montana area, and he does uh, surgery and oh, wow. stuff on your knees and your knees and hips and elbows and anything that go. could be hurt fly tying. <laughs> He's fishing, so. There you go. He's so doing... <laughs> he started. That was my that was my first my first. So he cut my load in about. He probably cut it by about a quarter. Him to being able to tie, which took some huge pressure off of me. In the meantime, I ended up at a trade show uh, and uh, just kind of looking around. I had another guy in the Logan area who had, was mentoring me as well, and we just ended up. I just ended up loving it, and so I had some wonderful older gentlemen that really let me let me grow, you know, and encouraged me along the way. So I went to the young man, and shortly after that, the orders kept coming. They got bigger. I took many of the new tra the trade show that I had been to, and it reached a point where I said, "Well, I've either got to totally shut this thing off, or I've got to." Um, do something about it to uh, to get the flies tied. And at that point, I took on a business partner. This would have been back in 89. And I was still being hounded by the Flaming Gorge Lodge to come up with something that was high rising. And I thought, well, foam is the only thing that I would know of. And just from, you know, some of the box, box things you got in the mail and stuff that have some foam in it, you know, some different kinds of foam. And so I had a chance to... to um, um, to use them and see what what we could improve on in the form that I was seeing. And so my eventual business partner, still not a business partner now, had some um, meetings to go to with uh, the cable company that was here in the Logan area. And while she was going to meetings, we, we had been... Um, I don't know, but I'm not sure how it all happened, but she ended up being a business partner to me. And while she was attending a, a meeting for the cable company there in, uh, um, can't think of the name of the little town. Oh yeah. I'm well, sorry. Was she, what, what was her, is she still your business partner? Well, officially now, no, but yes, she has, has been for about 20 about 20 years. And then again, like I said, I just retired myself from the um, the Asia factory there and they've retired me over there and oh, then we're working on. That's right. So eventually that happened here. So that was the other thing. So you were in Asia for uh, quite a while. And what was that like? So you spent half the year in Asia and half the year in, in uh, North America or how did that work? Uh, for, the, for 18 years of the 20 years, I would go over for at least nine to ten months of the year living in Asia and coming back here to be with family at Christmas time 
and tax time when we had to put <laughs> my signature to the taxes. So well, those are the only two times that I returned home. Otherwise, I was over there. We were developing new patterns, dealing with fun and innovative fly time materials. When I first got into this, we were all using natural product, which means horse mane, meant deer hide, it meant uh, muskrat fur. And so it was all natural. When I got into it, my innovation of, the, of what happened in the fly fishing was to take new materials that were being developed for, uh, for example, fabric or, or some costume jewelry or something like that. It would be used, and then I would take a look at it and go, well, what can we tie with this? Yep. And so that's kind of how I got started oh, go. in that. And so, and so now when you look at our product line, uh, obviously, I'm not doing a lot of that anymore, but we have also taken on what we call innovators who have been brought on to uh, uh, introduce patterns to us using some of the craziest materials you ever could imagine, but very successful, and we brought them on as an innovator, and they were given a 10% royalty for everything that we sold, and that worked out very well too. It took a lot of pressure off of me as well. Are these innovators? <laughs> so, are these are these your ambassadors? Is that the same thing? It's similar. Yes. Uh huh. And what they, uh, they they are some, yeah. So so they're they're developing fly. I mean, how do you choose who's going to be your innovators and ambassadors, or how did you choose? Good question. We would uh, we would every year the trade shows that we were part of. We would put the word out that we would be accepting uh, uh, new fly patterns. And if you were interested, to please talk to Jeff. Okay. At first I did it, but then after Jesse got on it, he does it. Now we have about 130, I think, now that are doing flies for us. When I, By the time I had reached the height of my, uh, of my career in this, yeah. or as far as innovation... I had about had created about 650, 60, 70 flies that were just my name that I had done. Really? Uh, part of what I le- part of what I left out in this was uh, when the Flaming Gorge was trying to get me to come up with patterns to have them fish high, and, I, and so we went to phone. And so while I was uh, Ellen, back to Ellen, uh, Ellen was tying. Excuse me, back up. Ellen was working with the cable company and attending trade uh, shows for the cable industry. And I just locked myself up in in a room and I just went to work on the telephone trying to find anybody that would be interested. I had decided at that time that extrusion was going to probably be my best bet for foam, which was our big uh, name brand to, it, to put myself in this industry. And it was called Rainey's float foam and it was a surrender a, a round piece of extruded foam uh-huh. and we went from three eighths of an inch all the way down to an eighth of an inch now we do down to a sixteenth of an inch over the time as things have has has been uh, as our pre or as my innovation has gone so mm. that's kind of the, the, the anyway it launched me into a career using so many slides if you look at our catalog or mostly the things that i've created are tied with some type of foam oh, in it are. somewhere in the body. No kidding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you don't tie, uh, yeah. so you, you have mostly dry flies then, not not that many nymphs? No, we would have, no, that, that's true. Mine was mostly in the dry fly, but in that dry fly portion, you've also got your big grand hoppers. You've got your, or excuse me, that's the name of the fly. Yeah. Big hoppers, um, um, uh, the cicada that was out. Right. Uh, the big, big, uh, many uh, different hopper patterns. Yeah, all the yeah. salmon fly, so, the, the big salmon fly patterns. Yeah, and all that. right. And then it turned from there. We went into bass fishing, and I came up with several patterns from that. And from there, we went into salt water, and I have developed many patterns with a foam in somewhere in the body that that could be used. And so huh. I crossed all genres of of fly fishing huh. and need. And then Ellen came up with our. My business partner at the time, Ellen, came up with uh, flies for every appetite, and so we we got rid of the rainy's uh, the rainy's flies. Uh, that little fir- the first little sign that I did when I first started the business had to get a business license. 
And so that was kind of narrowing. And so Ellen just came up with the fact that because by then we were tying many flies for every single aspect of bugs in the water, or feeding on the water, or whatever. And so she right. came up with the the, the rainy flies and supplies. And so we changed it to flies and supplies, fishing for every appetite. Oh, right. And that's kind of where we reason today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and what did Ellen so? She she eventually left, and, and now the business is basically you, Jesse. Are there others involved in it now? She's now started to learn a lot about the the flies that are and how they're made and oh, gotcha. the material aspect of stuff. So she so she's been able to. She's not all the way there, but she's got so darn close, and so that'll take a lot of pressure off me as well because yeah. I want to go play. In fact, I want to go fly fishing. Yeah, I could. Oh, I could someplace every every. Place. Over the years in Southeast, you know, in Asia, when you lived down there for 18 or 19 years, I mean, I imagine there's not, a, you know, a ton of fishing you did over there. I mean, what was that like living there for that long? Well, number one, I love the Thai people. Number two, I learned to love Thai food. Uh-huh. And But the, the part of fishing over there, there, it wasn't a lot when we were there, but it has grown, and mostly in the salt water. But they have a big fish that's called a snakehead, and yep. I have tried to go out and catch those things, and they're just mean. If you fell out of that little skinny boat you were in, you were eaten up real quick. So yeah. I kind of i had i had an inversion. You know, they have so many poisonous snakes that are in in the Asia area that you know I just I didn't do much there. But when I got home here, I would hit oh, it pretty heavy. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't you didn't yeah. ever feel like when you're out there for t- <clears throat> ten months out of the year that you were you were missing anything back in the United States. You felt like that was kind of, I mean, that was your home, right? In Southeast Asia? That, yes. Uh huh. But it was still, you know, I still love the, I have a, have a deep love for fly fishing and I'm not too bad at it, if I might say. <laughs> <laughs> so, and a bit, a bit ago, we talked about women in the industry. And at the time that I got into it, and then Ellen coming on as a business partner, there were there was just not any women. It just didn't exist. And uh, But there were women in companies at our trade shows that sold uh, trinkets and things with their shop name on it, little fun little plates and that kind of stuff. But no one had gotten into the actual tying of the sport, of the, of the tying of the fishing flies until I entered and Ellen came along board. So mm. uh, we tried and tried and tried and tried to get into the Utah uh, fishing market, but it was just, it was just almost impossible. And I'm not quite sure why, um, but I had a lot of uh, fishing shops and good friends outside of the state of Utah and by by the end of let's see about 19 mid 1980s uh, I finally got accepted here in Utah and my patterns became used and I became an item here in Utah but up until that for many many years it just wasn't going to happen there nobody wanted to you know a woman doesn't fly fish right yeah, well, doesn't, well isn't an <laughs> yeah, kind of. Bad. There were some. I mean, one woman that comes to mind who I interviewed uh, in a past episode was Joan Wolf. Did do you remember? You know her. Did you ever have oh, much yeah. of a connection with her? I mean, what was she a oh, was yeah. she a mentor for you back back then? Or absolutely. You know, uh, she didn't do a lot of fly tying, but her casting. She's known very well for her casting. Yeah, and she's promoted books and videos and you bet man i just i love her and have very fond memories of her we still had different things that we had achieved in the industry i'm not saying that joan doesn't tie flies but she's known for her casting yeah, no, and I, casting techniques yeah i don't think she's ever been too excited about the fly tying as much but yeah we had a we had a, a pretty fun conversation on, on uh, that was just uh, i think that was just a few months ago we, we had her on so that was a that was a pretty uh, pretty entertaining. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, but uh, okay. That's so, nice. so I mean, I'm sure that's the cool thing. And I've interviewed uh, you know a number of women on here, both all age groups and stuff. And yeah, it's cool because we're in a different time. You know, things are things are uh, getting uh, I guess easier for women. There's a, there's a, a more movement to get to get women into it. So I think it's it's cool. Uh, yeah. It's, it's nice. So now you're seeing quite a few women in the sport and out there on the stream. And yep. so it's, 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 it's nice. Yeah. I love it. What, uh, 
so all your flights, so you said uh, 675. What do you think, you know, if you had to pick uh, a couple of your, you know, maybe your favorite flies or maybe your best sellers, what, what, what would you have a couple names of your patterns? Yes, so probably the most notorious is the, what we call a grand hopper. It's done in many different colors and many different sizes. And it has, it really has filled the niche for uh, a big part of a fish's diet. And the grasshoppers are very, very prominent on rivers and streams, especially late summer, early fall. And some great, great fishing off of those. That would be one of my favorites that I've done. And then love the bass. Once I got into bass, developing flies for bass fishing, I loved it. And so mm-hmm. I have, I have, uh, Oh my gosh, so many patterns. I don't even know where to even take you to on those. But yeah. uh, part of the, part of the development of the bass flies were, was the possibility of doing so much in in use of foam, and that was became a real major part of my thought process. Was what can I do to imitate this, but we're going to do it out of foam, and we're going to shape it, and mm-hmm. make the colors, and do all of that kind of stuff. So. I've got a popping, there's a, we call a popping hopper. We've got hopper poppers. You know, so yep. Whether you're diving or diving hoppers, diving poppers, that kind of stuff. And I'm looking so at the grand, I'm looking at a grand hopper now online. It's from, uh, it looks like it's Big Y, uh, Big Y Fly Shop. And they've got, they're selling it for, it looks like 74 cents. I mean, and when I think of fly tying, I mean, can you talk about who are the people that are tying the fly? And I, I know I, I, when you got started in it, were, was the the Asian market a very uh, busy market when you started, or, or did you were you at the beginning of that? Uh, well, in the in the Chiang Mai Thailand area, which is where we ended up uh, setting up business. Um, number one, we had a lot of shops. Uh, excuse me, a lot of uh, tying companies that we were competitors to there in the Chiang Mai area. Mm. And you had mentioned the Grand Hopper. You quoted me on a price. What was it you said? Yeah, well, I, I'm, just, fly- I'm just looking online. Uh, the uh, the Big Y, uh, it's called Big Y Fly. I think it's the Big Y Fly Shop. They are selling one right now. Okay. I'm just going to click on it. Let's see if I can click on it. Yeah, Big Big Y, uh, uh, Big Y com. They have a Grand Hopper right now for... Um, seventy four cents. You could buy wow. six. You could buy six they, or more for seventy cents, which is pretty amazing. I mean, right? That's that seems like how do you make a profit on a fly if it's if it's that cheap? Well, you have to also be aware that many people, as creativity is part of this business, so is the theft of the creativity of the business, and so it would be very unlikely that uh, that this was tied by the Rainey's company. Uh, right. We have no. a lot of people who have copied us, but a grand hopper would be selling actually right now retail for about three to five, four dollars. Oh, okay. And is it, they're, I mean, they're quite expensive. if there's somebody out there tying a grand, if you invented a grand hopper, I mean, is it completely legal for anybody in the world just to tie it on their own and sell it? Or, or is that something you actually had a, you know, a trademark to or something? When those of us who've actually spent the time in the creation of these patterns and someone comes in and knocks it off and uh, claim it as theirs or something just like this company, they, you know, possibly, I'm not just possibly saying that it was not likely tied by us. So if it was, they're selling it way below oh, okay. the cost of what and we so, even, would have sold it for them. And so. so what if that person, for example, had, um, you know, they tied your fly, it's your exact pattern. You know, I can see, you know, they call it a different name, right? They don't even call it. But what if they just tie your pattern and and call it your pattern? So they, they attribute it to you. They say, this is Rainey's Fly, but they sell it as, yeah. uh, you know, they sell it from their shop. Is that not a, a, a okay thing to do? It's, no, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a good thing to do. Okay. It really isn't. Uh, it, for those who are inventing the patterns and coming up with different materials and, shapes or what have you yeah uh no it's just not a good idea but gotcha. but people do it and yep. how ethical it is well, you, i can tell you that i it's disappointing very disappointing that people do this yeah, yeah. we try very hard not to 
you know, we try to research every fly pattern that that we have come up with, or especially our innovators that are coming up with. Uh, we try very hard to do as much fact checking, fact checking as yeah. we can, to make sure that we can maintain the authenticity of it, and it would be a rainy fly. Gotcha. So, what do you think? What do you think the grand hopper uh, looks most, or what what pattern looks most like a grand hopper? Do you think, if you had to say another pattern that's a grasshopper that's out there, like the uh, what about the Latorte hopper? Do you know? Uh, Yes, it's a good pattern. Yes, there are many, many good patterns that, that have come oh, the, in after the, the, our grand hopper. The Latour has a, has deer hair, right? It's a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. The grand hopper yeah. is really so, is really um, at least the one I'm looking at. This might maybe you can describe. Well, this would be kind of fun. Can you describe the grand hopper that the pattern you tie in? And do you, are there a bunch of variations, or is there just one one grand hopper? Uh, there's some variations. People have taken part of the body and tied something and tied the body, the front of the fly, and maybe tied in that did something on the back differently and vice versa. But for the longest time, people t- looking to tie foam, they had to buy their foam from us. There are other companies now on the market that do a little bit in foam, but the Rainey's line, we're huge in the foam. We okay. do so much in shaping different bodies and stuff. So, like I said, we're just we're just big in that part of the the creativity part of the business. Like this last this last little while, we came out with a duck, and we come out with a huge mouse, and we come out with a incredibly huge hopper pattern. That you, know, you get them in there, and they start, you know, get them out in the water, and now they strip into you, and the noise that they make, and then the fish just coming up and hitting yeah. it so voraciously. I mean, that's so fun. It's really fun. Right? Yeah, that is cool. Well, the. Um... I'm looking at this. Well, this is this is kind of curious. Do you remember? I mean, the Grand Hopper, the one I'm looking at. This might not be yours, but it's got a a foam body that's uh, basically tied in segments, right? You use thread to segment the body, and then it's got. It looks like it's got a, a head. You know, it's got the foam head, and then it's got some. Looks like it has rubber legs on each side, and then it's got a some sort of a wing that's right over the body. I don't know if that's a um, yep. some sort of turkey mm-hmm. wing, and yeah. then it's got a little. A little yeah. yellow dubbing up front. Is that pretty much the pattern? Uh, it's similar, but there's still some changes. Uh, like we don't, it's not a yellow dubbing off the front. We do more of a, uh, it, we'll match the, we'll match whatever color uh, Grand Hopper they're wanting. We've tied Grand Hoppers in pink and purple oh, and I see. your natural colors and black and red and all different gotcha. colors. So we, we match that dubbing according to the, the color of yep. foam that's being used to I tie. See. I see. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, well, let's see. Um, you know, we're, we're going to be getting close to probably wrapping this thing up a little bit. I, I wanted to, you know, before we get out of here, just ask you a couple more questions. And I think we've dug into the back room, uh, the background of, of the company. It's been, you know, interesting. I mean, now that you're you're kind of thinking about getting out of it, is, is it one of those things where you're excited to retire or is it something where you maybe want to st- stay with it? Well, I'm not going to quit my innovation. I already turned in that notice to my <laughs> my business crew. Yeah, but I will still still remain doing that. But is it exciting? You bet. It's been fun. That I have a career that I've loved a, a passion, mm-hmm. and uh, that's been really good. It's been a, was a great way to earn a living to support my four children and. And, and it, it's just been a, it was just some good choices that, that, and good people that came into my life at a season in their lives or a season in my life where they were able to help me as I was continuing the development of, of, of the fly time, the art fly time. So, yeah, yeah that's awesome. How do you know when the, um, on the, the patterns, you know, with all these patterns you tied, how do you know when they're ready to, uh, to go out there and, and be fished? How, how do you know when the fly is just right? I mean, how would you do any testing or is this what, is this what the, your ambassadors do or what did you do before you had ambassadors? We would, we would go out and field test them. Uh, it was easy. Um, it was easy to, take a pattern in Asia, we'd have ponds and waters and swimming pools all around us over there. And we'd take the fly out into one of these areas and cast it out there. Or we use a swimming pool for a lot of, a lot of my thing, a lot of our testing because mm-hmm. it was convenient and living in an area. And people thought we were crazy, but 
<laughs> yeah. What's the person out there casting into a, a flight or casting before everybody wants to be on the pool? But that's how we did a lot of it. And yes, our, uh, our, uh, you use the word, I use the word, um, let's see, our innovators are also, uh, there to help us and the flies that they send us, they better for sure, sure be good. But we use them and we, we cross check the flies. So we had a fly submitted. It looks good, but does it fish good? And so we kind of take it from there and we send out to different, different tires or innovators would tie something that we're going to send it to, to other people who fish and see what feedback they want to give us. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't come from the same person that tied or suggested that we carry the pattern. It was done by our process of, of uh, we have a wonderful team on our, on yeah. our team. Jesse's an incredible uh, fisher, and we've got Paul Mason, who also helps Jesse and assists Jesse. Yep. And they've done an incredible is job, Jesse, too. So. Is Jesse your oldest boy or youngest, or where does he fit in? He's, I have four children and he's number three. Oh, he's number three. And we're, so, and, and so yeah. did you have all boys? No, I have a girl, boy, boy, girl. Okay. Girl, boy, boy, girl. So Jesse was the oldest of the boy, of the boys? No, the, he was a third. He was the third child. So he was in the second of the boys. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. And uh, so how do you know, you know, when you think about the flies, do you, would you say your flies, your, your, the, patterns you tied were more kind of impressionistic versus say exact matches or did you ever did you get into that where you're trying to tie things that looked really lifelike well i did both we yeah. did both but but i say about 50 50 actually okay i mean when you're especially when you're bass fishing you know you just need to get there's such territorial fish that you get it out in the area and you know they'll just they'll just come all over it so yeah but yeah i do I don't know. The grand tiger might even be, maybe not. I don't think it would be called impressionistic, but yeah. it, perhaps it's not exact. There's certainly some other innovators out there that come up with hoppers that we also carry that are very, very realistic oh, to, yeah. to the patterns. That's right. That's Lots right. of we have a lot of lot of good people out there in the industry now, and it's just grown so much. I know. In my that that, that my seems to be the amazing years. thing that you've built this this, uh, you know, this business. And like you said, you have 130 people or however many of these ambassadors. And it, it seems like it's grown up to this really big, you're one of the big companies. And I guess that's just a, a tribute to your dedication and, and just sticking in it for so many years. Right. I would agree with that. Yeah. That's, there's no, there's no real, the secret to your success. You don't have a, a special tip for somebody that was going to, what if, what if somebody's listening to this and they, they want to start tying flies for a living? Would you have any, uh, any tips for them? Well, I'd say to them that they need to be very tenacious, that it might take a long time to get a pattern recognized and fished, but they have to also understand that in business that you we get paid, what I call it, I said it's the 30, 35 principle where it's 30, 30, 30 years of your career is going to be very little money. And the last five years, that five years, hopefully you'll be able to turn it around and you're making what you lost for all those there you go. years. So, yeah. So that's right. So basically, but, yeah. but it's, it's, it's a little more difficult. It's a little more difficult now to be an individual and do like what I did many years ago. Yeah, uh, there are some people that are still trying to do that and yeah. uh, are tying specifically for certain shops, but um, it, right. it's it's pretty hard to be honest. Most most flies are are not USA tied these days, right? No, Africa is a huge market. Yeah. Of course, Eastern Asia, where I'm at, is a, is a big market, and uh, now we're seeing fly tying factories actually shooting up in the. Uh, uh, the Philippines and yeah. down in the Costa Rica area. So right. it has a lot more, we have a lot more innovation heading out to be tied overseas. Yeah. I would have loved to have left all of our flies being tied here. But at the time that I was learning flies, I hired, we worked with, I hired uh, Utah State University students to teach them how to tie the fly and say, all right, tie me uh, 150 dozen of this. You've got, <laughs> 
you've got what, two weeks to put it together for me. Right. And so we worked with university, university students for almost six, seven years. And then it finally just became, we couldn't keep up with it. And I had to either, we either had to cl- close the company down or, or see what we could do in Asia. And so we ended yeah. up, uh, uh, yeah. I, again, another long story, but yeah. uh, we were hired by different companies and it turned into, it just turned into a very lucrative market for us. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. And who is your, who, over the years and, and, and now, I mean, who's your competition out there? Are there other companies that you think about, or are you just kind of out there doing your own thing? We do. Uh, well, I I don't. I want to have a healthy relationship with all companies. Unfortunately, that you can't say that about some because they don't want to cooperate. You know, they don't want to live by a code of ethics, and so um, uh, we have like uh, Montana Fly is a competitor, mm-hmm. and oh, we yeah. have. Uh, Umpaw is a, is a big, uh, big competitor, and we we're just really good friends to the Umpaw yeah. team, and yeah. so. Uh, but it hasn't, like I said, it hasn't all been. It's a matter of working through the difficulties and yeah. we're talking things out, and not uh, you know if you're feeling offended by somebody, take it to them and say, "Hey, what are you doing? Talk to me about exactly. this." You know, stuff. So. Who, who does but, your? But they've been good. We've had, it, they've been yeah. Well, who who does your like the website for you? Do you have a person that that does the website and all the social media stuff? We we do, and I couldn't even tell you who it is. That's yeah. something we'd have to ask Jesse. Yeah, yeah, Jesse, yes, Jesse's we definitely have. Yeah. Uh huh. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So. Okay, uh, and you guys tie. I, I know Jesse's got some uh, some videos out there. Do you, are I mean, as far as resources, obviously you have a bunch of flies, but do you guys have a, a bunch of resources on you know tutorials and how tos on fly tying? You know, we've had many people who have asked us, and they've done it for us. Yeah. Uh, so they pull. You know, you'll see them in a lot of publications and in the in print. Years ago, though, uh, back in the, about the late '80s, we did a bunch of uh, videos, and you can still buy for some of the flies that I first came out with in the industry. We do have some CDs now that, that have that on, but that's not a. You know, people are so good at what they do. They can just look at it and go, oh, I can, I, I can do it. I understand how this is done. And so yeah. I don't know that people use a lot of tutorials, but there's a lot of good tutorials also on the web too. So Yeah, there are. There are. That's right. Yeah, you guys, when you go to your website, you pretty much have, I mean, your products are, are uh, I mean, you've got it separated, you know, new for, for this year. You've got foam products. Um, you know, you're always, develop, like you said, you're always innovating and now, You've always got new products coming. It seems like that would be the struggle. Is how do you find how do you find new products? It seems like you would just eventually run out of things to to, to tie with, but that's not the case. <laughs> that is, you would think that. I honestly agree. You would think that, but over time, as I look back and going in my career, going with just using natural product, and then all the and then all of the development and innovation of synthetic synthetic materials, uh, it's it's been quite a, it's been quite a, it's just a story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, uh, and I'm looking at something I've got, um, on, on your website at Rainey's flies, uh, under videos and guides, it looks like there's a five uh, disc DVD set and there's, um, it says Rainey's blue ribbon flies, Rainey's favorite foam flies, Rainey's. So it looks like you got some uh, some guides. I guess there's not a lot, and there's a, there's a few DVDs. So there are some resources that, that you have out there on, um, you know, from the stuff. And that must be the stuff you did in the '80s, huh? Uh huh. Yeah. yeah uh huh. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. But I haven't. We haven't done it. I've had many people. Well, Jess and, and I have discussed it, but we have wonderful people like you that like to do this kind of stuff, and so we just add our information and. Exactly. No, I think it's great. I mean, I think I was looking at another thing. You had a segment in yours called steelhead underground, I think in it. I, on this, uh, we've talked a lot about steelhead fishing on this, this show as well. And it's pretty, uh, you know, the steelhead underground, it sounds like you must have some pretty good people connected and, and flies. Is that, is that something that you've, you've tied some steelhead flies over the years? I have not myself, innovated any steelhead well that's not true i've taken and incorporated some other things from other tires and have a line but a very little bit not a lot of steelhead patterns we do a lot of innovation in that area with relying on uh, uh, individuals to 
submit patterns to us. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. And that's the, uh, yeah, there's been some innovation for sure over the years in, in the steelhead game, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like you said, you're, you're all over the salt water and there's, there's just no end. It seems like to these days, there's so many species out there to fish for. I think you probably will keep innovating. I'm sure. Right. That that's, is, that that's the plan, right? That is definitely the plan. Okay. All right, Randy. Well, I think we're about there. Um, you know, I, I mentioned, uh, we asked about the, the, uh, the top fly. Would you, do you want to throw another fly pattern in there that you really would, you, you know, other than the, the grand hopper that you is, is one that you think is a big one. And as you're looking, do you have a, uh, a vice, uh, that you, do you have one vice you love to use or do you use a lot of different vices? Uh, 90% of what I've used over the years has been a regal vice. Yeah. When I first got started, the only thing we had available to us were tools that were coming in and out of Asia and Pakistan. Yep. And so, but now I'm pretty much, I stick pretty much to a regal, but there are many wonderful vices out there. I was just this last show that we get came back from for the trade show in Denver. Yeah. There's incredible, a lot of different kinds of I know. vices. There, and are, stuff. there are, there are a ton. And, um, just to, uh, another question I occasionally ask, uh, do you, uh, are you into music? Do you have any uh, music you like to listen to or bands or types of music? Oh, I love music. Do you? That's another story too. My, uh, when I went, you know, when I went to the university, my university studies was in choral conducting, working with choirs. Oh, wow. And so I love music. I love music, so but that's another twist. I I have quite a twist of story, but I should write, should write <laughs> what, a book. What, what you that. should, yeah. Let's get a book going. What's the uh, so if you were going to be sitting down tying supplies right now and you're going to put on music, what, do you have a name of um, you know either uh, any type of music or would it be the choir? Or what would you put on right now? Right. Uh, well, it's getting Christmas time right now. It would be 100 percent Christmas music of any kind. Oh, so, really? Any right kind? Now. You don't have a favorite? You don't have a favorite? Yeah. Uh, like, uh, who's the big? Who's the big Christmas? Uh, the big uh, Christmas albums? Uh, I'm thinking like Frank Sinatra, right? Yeah, he's a crooner. I love his stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay, Frank Sinatra. Uh, Frank Sinatra. He's he's one that always comes to mind. There's. I like I like something that's uh, number one. It's got to be very melodic i like you know it's not just singing so much of music lately it's just singing a bunch of words on one note yeah so i like i like to listen to uh melodical things uh-huh. and i still can't find you know what that's okay that's okay don't don't worry about it we got we got tons of uh that's what's good about this this show i've got a i'll have a whole blog post with links for everybody to check out and so it won't be a problem we'll, we'll have it we'll have it covered Okay, so I'll uh, right. I'll have to throw some right. some uh, some Christmas music. I'll I'll throw some Christmas mu- music in the show notes. Maybe I'll find some Frank Sinatra for everybody. <laughs> I like to I like to mix it up. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, and, uh, uh, anything All else? Right. You know, Randy, before we let you go in the next uh, you know few months to a year, anything? I mean, obviously retirement is that the big thing on your list? Do you have anything else you want to let us know coming up? Uh, no, my retirement this year will be. Uh, will be the big thing that we're working towards and maybe I'll never get retired but <laughs> mm-hmm. but that is the plan okay and then I want to do a lot of fishing so there you go there you go no I think uh, you're you're similar all right. all right all right Ray well hey appreciate you coming right. on and uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch with you and check back with you okay. here next year all right thanks all right so thanks much, okay bye so there you go if you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered just go to wetflyswing.com slash 114 Go to the resources page at wetflyswing.com slash resources to find out what products are recommended by our guests and uh, and have been noted on this podcast. If you uh, purchase through any of those links, this gives the podcast a small commission and supports the show. It's a great way uh, to do that at no additional cost to you. Also, we're planning a summer steelhead hosted fly fishing trip this year to the Deschutes River. If you want to find out more about this trip, uh, go to wetflyswing.com slash fish the swing to get more information that's right fish the swing and wet fly swing uh on the shoots this year thanks again for some out to uh, check out the show today look forward to catching up with you soon hope to maybe see you online or on the river thanks for listening to the wet fly swing fly fishing show for notes and links from this episode visit wetflyswing.com and if you found this episode helpful please subscribe and leave a review on itunes 